so we'll we'll start off this morning um, with uh, some uh, kudos uh, that Planet was nice enough to send me. And the first one is uh, from Graham Nickel, <clears throat> one of the ED attendings at Harborview, and from Dennis Kell, one of our plastic surgeons. And this was for Sean Chang. And uh, they were thanking Sean for uh, providing prompt, detailed, and kind care. Uh, the dad uh, noted that he was on the ball. Uh, and Dennis uh, said, thank you, Sean. Uh, your care in the ED was very much appreciated. Uh, the second one is from uh, Renata Thronson, who's the Associate uh, Program Director for uh, Medicine. At, and she's at Harborview, and she wanted to thank Jay Yao for uh, uh, detecting a very large lytic lesion um, on a plain film that he was uh, reviewing for her. Uh, Dr. Thronson said that Jay uh, made the call, called her right away, reviewed the film, and discussed his differential, and then made some Herculean efforts to coordinate care with uh, UW uh, Medical Center. So uh, thank you for that, Jay. And uh, the third one is for Dr. Kennedy, um, who is thanking uh, Megan Turrell, Madeline Jackson, and Mike Alley. And uh, Dr. Kennedy said that he had the first case ever of, a pers of persistent finger pallor and numbness after a uh, block using lidocaine and epinephrine and uh, that Dr. Terrell Jackson and Ali did an incredible job taking care of the patient, ultimately giving fentolamine injections for reversal. And uh, Megan going in personally because she assisted in the surgery. And uh, Steve goes on to say that the family uh, was very grateful that the uh, care for those uh, three physicians provided. So um, thank you all. Um, with that, it's my uh, pleasure to um, introduce um, Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, Grand Rounds are going to start with Jimmy Zhu, um, who is uh, going into spine surgery and will be doing a fellowship um, next year at Mass General Hospital. And Dr. Viral Patel, um, who we all know as one of our spine surgeons uh, based at uh, the UW Medical Center. And they're going to be speaking about the lateral lumbar approach and advances in minimally invasive spine surgery. So thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Chansky, for the introduction. Thanks for uh, Dr. Turrell and Dr. Shin for organizing Grand Rounds and Mr. Shaw <coughs> for the technical support. Yeah, I'm, uh, okay. I'm going to interrupt for one second. I want to thank Dr. Turrell uh, because I think she's handing off Grand Rounds to Dr. Shin. And um, it's, it's not always easy, particularly post-COVID, uh, when we don't really ever see each other in person to keep Grand Rounds running so smoothly. So, so thank you for your help over the past year, Megan. Sorry, Jimmy. Oh. Yeah, I'm honored to uh, give this Grand Rounds with uh, Dr. Patel today on this topic. Um, I do not have any disclosures, and uh, neither does Dr. Patel relevant to this presentation. Uh, my portion of the presentation will cover the following topics, history of the lateral approach, its relevant anatomy, advantages, complications, indications, and future directions. And Dr. Patel will discuss in details the OR setup, techniques, and patient outcomes. Lateral approach is one of the many approaches used to access the lumbar spine for antibody fusion surgery, which is an established treatment for a range of spinal disorders. The anterior approach to the lumbar spine was initially introduced to manage spondylolisthesis and post disease in 1933 by Dr. Burns via transperitoneal approach. Anterior lumbar antibody fusion provided broad service for structural graft and corrected intervertebral height. Posterior lumbar antibody fusion was initially described in 1953 by Dr. Cloward and continues to evolve. It allows for a 360 degree fusion through a single approach. However, neural retra uh, retraction is one component of the approach. And for that reason, transforaminal lumbar antibody fusion was introduced in 1982 by Dr. Harms to address shortcomings of traditional PLIF. With regard to retroperitoneal approach, the flank retroperitoneal approach was first developed 
and described in 1980s by Sir Ashley Cooper as means for vascular repair. Retroperitoneal approach to treat spine disorders was described in 1944 by Dr. Iwahara for degenerative disease and interbody fusion. It was further developed by Hutchinson and Stock in 1950s as foundation for modern ALIF. Dr. Kamben performed the, um, in, well, in order to safely perform procedures such as disc removal, interbody fusion, technique needs to be accompanied by technology. And Dr. Kamben performed the first percutaneous fluoroscopic assisted lumbar discectomy in 1987 and defined Kamben's triangle as a relationship between traversing nerve root, exiting nerve root, and vertebral body. Tubular access was first reported by Falbert and Casper in 1991, and subsequently the first microendoscopic discectomy was performed by Foley and Smith in 1997. The first lateral transoas approach was described by Mayer in 1997 when he performed interbody fusion in 20 patients. The patients are placed in the right lateral decubitus position on an adjustable surgical table. The table is tilted to create the left convex bend bending of the lumbar spine. An approximate four centimeter incision is centered above projection of five S1 to space is obstructed by the iliac crest. In order to perform the lateral approach safely, an intimate knowledge of the retroperitoneal anatomy is required. And as orthopedic surgeons, this is not a space we find ourselves in frequently. The extra peritoneal space is found between the parietal peritoneum and the investing fascia of muscles. It circumferentially surrounds the abdominal cavity. And the retroperitoneal space is found posteriorly and laterally. Within the retroperitoneum are vital organs, including the ascending and descending colon, duodenal loop, pancreas, kidneys, renal vessels, adrenal glands, proximal ureter, and fat tissue. The retroperitoneal membrane and fascia are complex and multi-layered. Once we arrive at the psoas muscle by blunt dissection, Within the psoas muscle is lumbar plexus, which is formed by the anterior rami of lumbar spinal nerves, L1 to L4, with contribution from T12. These include the iliohepagastric nerve, ilioinguinal nerve, genital femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, obturator nerve, and femoral nerve. The iliohepagastric and ilioinguinal nerve innervate the abdominal muscles and provide sensation to the gluteal and genital regions. They can be found superficially during the approach. This network of nerves is prone to injury during the transoas approach as they cross the vertebral body. Eurabe studied the anatomic relationship between vertebral body and the lumbar plexus. The anterior and posterior edges of the vertebral body was divided into four zones and at each segment, the psoas muscle, lumbar plexus and nerve roots were dissected. The lumbosacral plexus is most dorsally position at the posterior end plate of L1 and L2. With general trend of progressive ventral migration from L2-3 to L4-5, the safe zones at L1-2 to L3-4 are the middle posterior quarter of the vertebral body, and the safe zone on L4-5 is at the midpoint. The genital femoral nerve can be injured in zone two and zone one at the lower lumbar levels. Generally, studies show that when approaching the lumbar spine from L1 to L3, the psoas muscle should be split in ventral three quarters of the vertebral body to avoid nerve injury. EMG can be used to detect the lumbar plexus. If a dilator passes in proximity to the lumbar plexus, a surgeon is warned both visibly on a graphic display and also via auditory feedback. The surgeon can then adjust his or her trajectory to reduce the likelihood of neural injury. Modern neuromonitoring devices incorporate EMG, SSEP, MEP. The goal is to place the retractors anterior to the lumbar plexus. Prolonged retraction time and coincident increases in trigger EMG threshold are both predictors of symptomatic neuropraxia. The incidence of uh, postoperative neuropraxia may be reduced by limiting retraction time and utilizing triggered EMG throughout retraction. And Dr. Patel will discuss more in details. Theoretical benefits of x lift include less blood loss as the approach generally requires an incision less than four centimeter, and most of the approach is achieved through blunt dissection. This may lead to less operative time, post-operative pain, and shorter hospital stay. Other 
Other advantages include indirect decompression of neural elements, larger implant placement, perfusion, and preserving stabilizing st structures such as the anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament. With traditional T lift or P lift, there may be significant paraspinal iatrogenic injury associated with prolonged muscle retraction. This may delay recovery and mobilization due to approach related muscle trauma. Wachke studied 30 consecutive patients who underwent posterior lumbar antibody fusion and instrumentation via open lumbar midline approach. Needle EMG of paraspinal muscles was performed preoperatively at six and 12 months. And paraspinal uh, muscle volume was determined by volumetric analysis of thin light CT scans preoperatively at one year after surgery. There was a significant increase of EMG denervation activity and reduced recruitment of motor units after one year. The paraspinal muscle volume also significantly decreased. X-lift can be accomplished without disrupting the paraspinal muscles. A-lift requires prolonged retraction of the peritoneum, which can lead to bowel injury or postoperative ileus. Great vessels have to be mobilized, which increases the risk of vascular injury. X-lift does not require significant bowel or vessel retraction. Other disadvantages of A-lift technique include approach related complications, such as retrograde ejaculation, and often requires an exit surgeon. A-lift also sacrifices the anterior longitudinal ligament, which can be preserved in X-lift, allowing for standalone constructs without posterior augmentation in selective cases. X-lift cages are designed to span the entire ring apophysis for maximum stability. The apophyseal ring surrounding the periphery of the vertebral body consists of cortical bone, it's an ideal site for interbody cage placement since it offers more stability than the soft cancellous bone of inner end plates. Biomechanical studies have shown that A-lift and L-lift have larger footprint and subsidence resistance. Again, the intact anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament provide extra support for interbody cage and theoretically greater stability in the setting of standalone constructs utilizing ligamental taxis. In this picture, the, for the illustration of the L-lift, typically the implant is actually wider um, covering the uh, entire cortical bone. In the cadaveric study, Tatsumi examined end plate preparation used for different minimally invasive techniques, including mini open A-lift, minimally invasive P-lift, minimally invasive uh, T-lift, as well as the uh, X-lift. End plates were digitally photographed and evaluated using image analysis software. Area of end plate preparation was measured and qualitative evaluation was performed to grade the quality of preparation. The study concluded that X-lift approach resulted in the greatest relative area of end plate preparation. <clears throat> Traditional treatment of symptomatic lumbar stenosis has been by direct posterior decompression including the removal of ligamentum flavum, laminotomy or laminectomy, facetectomy as needed. X-lift allows for indirect decompression of neural elements by distracting between the vertebra. As shown here, the opening of epidural space and neural foramen are increased after placement of the interbody. Oliviera ex, uh, examined pre and postoperative MRI images of X-lift patients and took measurements including disc height, foraminal height, foraminal area, and canal body. There was a substantial dimensional improvement in all radiographic parameters with about 42% increase in disc height, 13.5% in foraminal height, 24.7% in foraminal area, and 33.1% in uh, central di uh, canal diameter. Over time, authors have found that predictors of poor outcome for indirect decompression can be found on preoperative imaging, including congenitally short particles, uncontained disc herniation, significant facet arthropathy, locked facets, PLL or osteophytes arising from posterior amplates with complete or near compromise of the lateral recess and synovial cysts. 
More advanced application of XLIF include usage of hyperlordotic cages with anterior longitudinal ligament release and anterior column realignment in deformity correction. Several groups have shown that LLIF ACR provides equivalent deformity correction compared to pedicle subtracting osteotomy with less blood loss. This is, gives us more arsenal in achieving global balance than previously offered by Schwab in his spine osteotomy letter. However, x lift can also be combined with various posterior column osteotomies to achieve significant sagittal balance. This is the case of someone who underwent anterior longitudinal ligament release with hyperlordotic cage and complete facedectomies posteriorly. We can see the correction uh, in figures E and F from preoperative and postoperative films. Here's an example showing release of ALL with vertebrate uh, with pedicle subtracting osteotomy across the inferior vertebral body below the level AL release for focal kyphotic deformity. Again, we can appreciate in figures F and G the preoperative and postoperative differences. This is an example showing release of ALL with vertebrectomy of the inferior vertebral body in treatment of local kyphosis with osteomyelitis. Various complications are associated with x lift including but not limited to, to a hip flexion weakness, neurologic injury, vascular and visceral injury, pseudohernia, and subsidence. HG performed a systematic review analyzing the rates of medical and surgical complications associated with x lift In a total of 6,819 patients, the rate of complications were as follows. Wound 1.38%, cardiac 1.86, vascular 0.81, pulmonary 1.41, GI, urologic, etc. The transient neurologic deficit was 36.07%. Persistent neurologic, however, was 3.98%. And operative, which includes fractures, pseudoarthrosis, implant failure, reoperation, was 9.22%. We can see that transient neurologic complication is a significant part of this approach, and patients should be counseled. Here's an uh, example of subsidence following standalone x uh, interbody placement. Preoperative lateral radiograph and sagittal MRI showing degenerative sp spondylolisthesis, and the intraoperative lateral fluoroscopy showing restoration of this height. The postoperative lateral radiograph and sagittal MRI showing loss of correction following subsidence. And we can see again here the canal is significantly narrow. Here's an example of pseudo hernia caused by injury to the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves during the approach. The applications of x lift has been broad. Reported cases include degenerative for degenerative disc disease, spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, adjacent segment disease, recurrent disc herniation, and in some cases, osteomyelitis, tumor, and trauma. In terms of future directions, surgeons can perform x lift and pedicle screw fixation via fluoroscopy or image guidance in a single lateral position. This uh, significantly decreases operative time as patient does not have to be repositioned. Also, a new area of development is prone single position x lift. The retraction of the uh, peritoneal cavities is facilitated by gravity. However, more studies have to be done to demonstrate their safety and efficacy. And with this, I conclude uh, my portion of the talk. Thank you, everyone. And I especially want to thank the faculty of uh, our spine department for their mentorship over the past four years. All right. So I will start to go through the procedure step by step and starting from the position to the end. And then we'll do some literature reviews afterwards. So it is important to which table you use. I mean, Jimmy already mentioned, but you need a table which breaks down in between. So in this picture, I use a sky turntable. And uh, 
So that helps to, to open up the flank. So you can, so make sure you position your patient to have his highest point of iliac crest is one inch above the break point of the table. Otherwise the patient usually slides down if you don't keep that way. So that whole, that helps to open up the flank area between the iliac crest and the lowest rib for the approach. Also helps the correction of the deformity if patients are having any coronal, uh, coronal deformity. So if you keep the concavity of the deformity up, that helps to correct the deformity just by positioning. And, but please do not do any excessive bending because it actually stretches your psoas muscle and also your lumbar plexus. So that can have a stretch injury as well. So when you, when you do any later position is usually is unstable, right? So it's uh, as compared to your prone and supine position. So, so we have to make sure you secure your patient with one bandage on the chest wall and one bandage onto the greater trochanter with you need an axillary roll underneath the, underneath the axilla. For legs, uh, you need a figure of eight support, uh, which helps to keep your legs in the same position the entire time. Because during the surgery, when you are stimulating with the EMGs and MEPs, your, your, your legs tends to move, and, uh, but you need, a, you need to keep your knees and hip flex in the entire time to keep your psoas muscle relaxed on, uh, on the side you are approaching. So that's important. And I use a co-band six inch, which helps, uh, uh, it's easy to put on. And uh, it also helps while positioning to move, move the patient as well. So this is at most important uh, that you get a CM tax life easy. And by doing that, you can make your life easy during the entire procedure, because this is pretty minimal invasive. So you need a uh, CM guidance all the time. So please get the lateral x-ray for the disc you're operating on. Uh, with the angle of all this in uh, all the angles on CM machine, it has to be on zero. So you can move your patient or your table to get the perfect lateral x-ray. And you can see, you can see on a CM that I'm getting the perfect lateral x-rays um, at the L23 disc. Uh, it's right here. So it's basically uh, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the importance, why this is important during the procedure. So after this, you also have to make sure you got the anteroposterior x-rays on the CM as well to uh, um, perfect AP x-ray on a CM shot. And secondly, make sure you make, make your radio check aware the all the positions of your CM, how, how you need it during the lateral and AP x-rays. Um, you can see I have a two CM tag of one is a trainee, so that sometimes doesn't help. Um, then you have to mark the mark the, your desk exactly on the, on the CM on the lateral view. That's going to be your skin incision. So most of the patients has a disc disc is on a lateral view, almost a three to four centimeters. So your incision is going to be like three to four centimeters. So. And then sometimes you have this kind of patients that you have a rotational deformity and the coronal deformity. That's time is really, it's really hard to get the perfect lateral and anteroposterior x-rays, but you can try as much as you can. So this is the patient I'm gonna show you. So this is, a, this is the best I can get uh, anteroposterior x-rays uh, for this patient because he has a, you can see he has a coronal deformity and the rotational deformity as well at this level. On a lateral view, it's uh, also harder to get the perfect lateral because this patient has a coronal deformity. So both vertebra is in a different plane on a, and the AP X-ray. So try to get the one vertebra in a perfect lateral. So here I'm getting, a, so this is the patient as a L3 as a lowest screw. So here I'm get, uh, trying to get the perfect lateral X-ray for L3. So now the next step is you, you go through on top of the incision, you do go through the dissection. So you start your incision right on the disc on a skin marking, you cut the skin, then you have a subcutaneous tissue you divide, and then you have a fascia on top of the external ob oblique muscle that is important at the time of closure. Once you cut that, you are on the muscle. So everything else is just a muscle splitting like parallel to your muscle fibers and just everything is blunt dissection so that you can preserve any nerve in between if you, if you encounter iliohypogastric or 
ilioinguinal nerves. So you split your external oblique, you split your internal oblique, and you can split your transverse abdominis muscle. And just underneath the transverse abdominis muscle, you will you can able to palpate the top fascia, which is fascia transversalis. Once you pop that fascia with the finger, is, which is also a blunt dissection, as soon as you pass your finger into the fascia, you can able to see the retroperitoneal tract. So now you can swipe your finger posteriorly and palpate the quadratus lumbar mu muscle and try to, trying to palpate the transverse process. And then you go more towards the body of the, uh, body of the vertebrae, you can able to palpate the psoas muscle. So that's where you stop. Once you were able to palpate the psoas muscle with the finger, now you can pass the guide wire with the help of your finger um, on, to the, on top of the psoas muscle. So it's important where you land this guide wire. So, so as Jimmy mentioned already, the, your safe zone is just posterior to your, to, your, to your middle of the disc on a lateral view. So for this patient, it's harder to where you're gonna do the lateral view, where, what you consider as the middle of the, um, middle of the disc. So what I did, if you, if you do the middle of the disc of upper end plate, that's gonna land here which is probably more anterior for this vertebral body. If you do the center of the disc here, then you can add more posteriorly for this vertebral body and near to the lumbar plexus. So I decided to do the like, okay, I'll, I'll see where, where I'm in, where these vertebral bodies are actually in contact. I'm gonna go center of that and then see how it goes. So, so, so usual point when you don't have any spondylolisthesis, you always start a little bit posterior to your midline, the, your middle of the disc. Now you take AP X-ray, and your guide wires should go into the disc. And during entire time, once you start to go through the psoas to the disc, you always triggering the EMGs. You're always running the. Uh, uh, neuromonitoring to make sure your thresh thresholds remains um, below above, above eight. So when you stimulate more, more you're not gonna have any EMGs or MEPs like when you stimulate eight milliamperes. So that means you are away from the nerves. So now you're, once you pass the guide wire, the next step is to, you create the pathway from skin to all the way down to the disc by using the dilator on top of the on top of the guide wire. Um, that during the entire time, there are two dilators or most of the system has, which goes on the guide wire. So that also guide, the, all the dilator has a, a stimulator inside. So you can put on the stimulator on top and then pass the guide wire through the psoas all the way down to the disc um, and then running your, and then triggering the EMG entire time to making sure that you are away from the um, away from the nerve. So this is the AP X-ray. You can see there's the two dilators on top of the uh, guide wire, which is dark on top of the disc between L3 and L4 in this case. So now the next step is you pass the tube system on top of the dilator, which is goes all the way dark, all the way to the disc. Uh, this dilator has uh, three arms. So there is one, two anterior arms, which is one is cranial. One is caudal, and there is one arm posterior. Okay, this is the tube system you can see on an AP X-ray, which is dark all the way to the disc. So, which is important that you are on the disc, uh, not into the psoas muscle. Now you can actually stimulate your you know, stimulate your all the arms, the making sure they are away from the disc, uh, away from the nerve, and uh, now you can open up your you can widen up your anterior two arms and then you can also push the posterior arm a little bit posterior to gap open this whole area. And you can also, uh, also stimulate inside near the arms with the trigger EMGs, making sure there is no nerve inside where, you're, where your working channel is and your nerves are away from the dilators. So this is how, this is the other patient actually, but this is how you're supposed to see like the, your desk, you're right on dock onto the desk and you can see this much about like anterior two third part of the desk. Once you, once you have everything set it up, you have a shim on a posterior arm of this dilator. So you can push the shim inside the desk, 
that stabilize your posterior arm of your dilator's tube system, and you're not gonna move that tube system more posteriorly. So that prevents your lumbar plexus injuries. And also when you pass any instrument inside the disc, that shim also prevents you going more posterior that you can end it up into the uh, lumbar canal and injuring the dura. So now the next step is you do the anilotomy with the knife and then you start using a cob elevator to end plates to remove the cartilaginous end plates. And this is where you are important why we got a lateral, perfect lateral x-rays and a perfect AP x-rays on a patient's positions because your cob has to be like literally perpendicular to your floor because you're all lateral, x lateral of the patient is like when you take a Siam shot is or Siam is all, all the angles are zero, means your patient is pretty perpendicular to the floor. So your cob has to be very perpendicular and straight up and down. Um, so you're not gonna go anteriorly. You, there's always, you tends to go more anteriorly because posteriorly side, you have a shame that prevents you going posteriorly. And then if you go more anteriorly, you know that you have a bigger vessels you can injure. That's extremely, uh, extremely rare, but that's possible if you don't pay attention that which direction you are going. So that's Im important why you would take a perfect lateral x-ray. So then you, for this, I usually use a cop to go all the way to the other side of the annulus. And I actually pop open the annulus with the, with the use of the mallet. You have to make sure you don't go too much to the other side. Uh, otherwise you're gonna injure the lumbar plexus to the other side. Also, you can also injure the psoas muscle and patient can have a psoas hematoma on the other side. Um, and then that makes it harder for the rehabilitation post-op. So then you start using a shavers to shave your end plates. Um, so now once you're done with the end plate shaving, you, have, you start using trials with various heights until you, you find the press pit. So you can see that you can actually use all the trials. Ultimately, you find the right trial for your patient's desk. And then you can see it once you start your, you have an angle, your coronal deformity. But once you have this press pit graft, I mean, trial in, is pretty much your discs are pretty much parallel to each other. So you can correct your coronal deformity with it. So next step is to put your cage in. Uh, this is a pig cage. And then the, that cage has a three radio opaque markers that one on the other one side, one in the other side, and then one in the center, which you can try to get in the center of the vertebral body, like in the spinous process line. And uh, so this one in the center is an anterior two. So you can see there is one end here. So you, when you take a lateral x-ray, you know where you are in the cage. And then two lines are on the sides are actually posterior. So on the lateral view, you can see where your posterior border of the cage. So this is the final, uh, final x-rays. Uh, uh, I, once I'm done with the posterior fixation as well. So this is the final AP x-ray. You can see we can correct the coronal deformity pretty substantially just by one level one level interbody fusion. And also I able to correct the uh, sagittal deformity, able to create some lordosis and uh, able to create the disc height, uh, which is completely collapsed before. So, so this paper was published with the comparison uh, between the conventional posterior lumbar interbody fusion versus the lateral lumbar interbody fusion. And uh, they did not did any direct decompression. So interbody fusions without, without any direct, uh, direct decompression, they concluded that clinical and radiological outcomes are pretty comparable in between the two procedures. So this uh, another paper is, is comparing the minimal invasive transpyramidal lumbar interbody fusion and the XLIP with the indirect decompression which clinical outcomes are pretty comparable for the back pain, leg pain, ODIs, uh, but they do have a hip flexion weakness on X-lip group, for, which is resolved in the six month, but that's cumbersome for after the surgery, right after the surgery for initial six months. So that's the same uh, author actually did the preoperative and postoperative MRI and CT scan in the patients with the X-lip and MIS transpyramidal lumbar interbody fusion. Uh, and they find out that uh, the central canals are very, actually more open with the direct decompression than the indirect decompression. Um, 
they find out that there is a hundred percent fusion rate in the two groups, but that's this whole thing actually begs the question whether the indirect compression decompression is sufficient to achieve the goal of the surgery. So I was trying to find more more studies around for around the indirect decompression. So this is the study the author had did the preoperative and postoperative MRI determined the ligament of glioma area thickness and a cross sections area of a thecal sac uh, before and after the axillary. And they find out they increase the cross sectional area for a thecal sac by 50% after just by doing the later lumbar interbody fusion. So this is another paper. Yeah, the numbers of the patients are pretty low. It's just a 21 patient study. Uh, they look for the high, disc height, foraminal height, foraminal area, and a center canal between preoperative and postoperative MRI. The all radiograph parameters and dimensions are substantially improved uh, compared to pre-op, but but there is a risk of uh, you're gonna you're gonna lose the uh, the lose the correction just by subsidence of the cage, and then you can lose the decompression because you're just relying on to the distraction of the disc that helps to distract your ligamentum phloem and the posterior annulus to get your central canal a little bit wider. So if you lost the correction, then you, you, you're probably gonna lose the decompression. So they ended up actually re revising two patients out of 21, which is kind of 10%. Uh, they had to go back in and then revise it from the posterior. So this study shows the actually do helps increase the foraminal height and indirect decompression by 35%. So I think foraminal height you can achieve pretty, bad, pretty good because you can distract the disc that opens up the foramen in the back. But uh, so this is a study uh, I feel uh, is also important to know because there are 41 patients. Uh, they did the x with with without any pedicle screws fixation and uh, they did the indirect decompression. 13 patients out of 45, they fail indirect decompression. So the definition of the failed decompression is they define as the ODI score did not improve by 20 points or the patient required a revision surgery in form of the posterior fixation and the decompression within a six month postoperative link. So they find out if you have a preoperative significant smaller center canal, that patient has a higher risk, but there is one independent factor they find out that fails the indirect decompression is bony lateral stenosis. So this is what their picture in, the, uh, the, in, in their uh, paper is. You can see there is a lateral recess stenosis and a central canal stenosis here. They did the axlob. They, I mean, they open up a little bit in the central canal, but lateral recess by distraction and bony stenosis is actually more compressed uh, postoperatively than, than before the surgery. So I was looking at the paper who actually reviewed the literature for the indirect decompressions. Uh, uh, so they find out the 200 articles, they find out the efficient, it's efficient, all the papers shows that it is the efficient for the tech, efficient technique for the decompression of the foramen stenosis, but central and lateral recess stenosis from the lateral lumbar interbody fusion is, evidence is pretty low and then results are inconsistent. So I would be careful with the indirect decompression. I will get a, a, any patient you want to do indirect decompression, please get a CT myelogram before surgery to make sure there is no bony lateral recess stenosis and make sure there is no osteophyte which is wrapped around the nerve in the foramen, which actually sometimes harder, even with the dis di distraction of the disc, you cannot get the decompress. And then also the levels are also important to which levels you are doing it. But don't take me wrong because you can actually achieve uh, indirect decompression by the anterior just by the interbody. So this is Michael Wick's patient. Uh, he was my co-fellow. This is his patient's pictures. So um, sorry for the uh, not a good quality pictures, but you can see preoperatively this patient is fused from L3 to S1 and then the complete disc collapse. Um, he did uh, L2-3 standalone anterior lumbar interbody fusion with the, with the fixation some. And you can see that in the Preoperatively, there is a central canal stenosis and lateral recess stenosis. You cannot see any CSF fluid, but postoperatively, you can able to see um, able to see the central canal with the CSF and the, some nerve roots there. So that comes to the patient reported outcome with the lumbar interbody fusions. Uh, the, most of the literature demonstrates the improves in the patient reported outcome for axlip 
with the various pathology, which is comparable to the conventional posterior lumbar interbody fusions for ODI and vascoids. So that comes to my case, like case number one. Uh, she is a 54-year female, had a 12-year history of a T10 to L3 posterior spinal fusion for the scoliosis. And now she, she, she came back in the clinic to see us for back pain and the right-sided leg lower extremity pain, which is increased with the activities. And she works as a lawyer. So this is a, her preoperative x-rays. And uh, you can see there is a coronary deformity. This is what a uh, patients I saw all the intraoperative imagings. Uh, secondly, she also has a spondylolisthesis just below the level of the fusion. She, that's bit, the, the level of the fusion stop at the L3. This is L4. So she has L3 for spondylolisthesis. She also has a degeneration between four and five. And then L5 is a sacralized. So it's pretty fixed uh, to the sacrum. Uh, this is a flexion and extension ring. You can see between four and five, there is no spondylolisthesis, but she do have a uh, spondylolisthesis between three and four. This is the MRI cut at the L3 and L4. This is the MRI cut between uh, L4 and L5. And then you can see uh, she has a foramen stenosis right there on the right side between L3 and 4. And that was a that was a that was the main reason why she was having a right sided lower extremity pain. So the discussion with her, I, I told her that it, I think we need to extend your fusion at least one level down to get this uh, foramen decompressed. But, and on the other hand, she has a L5 sacralized, so only this that remains mobile after the fusion, which is gonna be L4 and L5. And she also has a wear of this disc. So I, I actually advise her to go uh, fuse all the way down to the pelvis, but you know sometimes the patient has their own opinions so she, she read through the, everything and she wants, uh, she told me that, you know what, I read through the all the online and then the, to achieve the greater foraminal height, I think uh, I need a, a later lumbar interbody fusion. And I, I just want to get just one level fusion. So I think the patient wants, uh, she actually preferred to have later lumbar interbody fusion. So this is another, so this is what we achieved. So, and uh, preoperatively, she has a coronal deformity. She do have a sagittal deformity. That's why she has a retroverted pelvis. When you, when you see on an AP x-ray, you can see the obturator foramens are open and you can see all the foramens and sacrum and your, your bottom part of the sacrum is actually below the pubic symphysis, which, which confirms that she is retroverting to stand up straight. This is postoperative x-ray just by doing one, one uh, lumbar interbody fusion, we can correct the coronal deformity. Also, that help her sagittal deformity correction. And now you can see the postoperatively, the AP extra of the pelvis is not, not as much as retroverted as before. So this is her X-ray from uh, later view. And as you can see, um, before surgery, she did not have a spondy between four and five. Now I end your and her fusion at the at the four, now she has a spondylitis, this is a four or five, but she is not symptomatic from it for now. So this is her one year follow-up. Um, it's her preoperative ODI was 64 on March, 2019, and postoperative ODI is, uh, is a 22, which is significant reduction in the, uh, in the ODI score. This is her incision, which is about 3.5 centimeter on the later side. Um, so this is case number two. It's, uh, this is a 56-year-old male. I had a three-year status post from L3 to L5 fusion. And uh, he initially, he had a L3 to 5 decompression. And then uh, he developed the adjacent level disease at L2, 3 and ended up having a decompression at L2, 3. Uh, and then he came back again uh, with complaint of the back pain and leg pain which increased with the seating, standing, and walking improves with the lying down. And his preoperative ODR was 62. This is his preoperative x-rays. He, he was fused between L3 to L5. And uh, he already had a decompression done between L2 and L3 uh, before he saw me. So this is his uh, 
X-rays and next change in view. Um, so this is his MRI. Even though he had a 1D compression between L2 and L3, he developed the compression again between L2 and L3. And also you can see the facet joint widenings between L2 and L3. And then, uh, so my, my I mean, there's, it's a, my goal is to get this discompressed and then I'm probably gonna extend her, his fusion one level above. The question becomes how you do the interbody between L2 and L3. And then with the previous fusions, and it's, he, my, I was anticipating more uh, scarring there. And then you already have a smaller window to start with when you are L2, 3. And now you have a scar on top of the, uh, from the previous surgery. So that even makes it sometimes harder to put the telegraph bigger. So I, that's why I decided to do the x lip for this patient. So this is what we ended up, how you can see how, how much bigger cage and uh, grafting we can able to do with the x lip positions. And I extended his uh, posterior fusion, uh, posterior instrumentation to one level above. So in conclusion, uh, it's a steep learning curve uh, for the surgeon and the whole surgical team uh, for the scrub nurse and, and radio track, everyone. And that actually increased your surgical time and um, which is, which is kind of is not good for your, while you are doing a retraction on lumbar flexors, you wanna get this surgery done uh, as quick, as quicker and safer as possible. But so I think the surgical team uh, teaching is also important. Um, the good thing about this is you don't require any access surgeon. You can access your approach by yourself. And uh, most of the surgeon has issues with the uh, scheduling the stuff with the, with the vascular surgeon or general surgeons to get together. Um, the careful review of the preoperative MRI and CT scan is utmost important because uh, you have to make sure where you are, your great vessels according to, uh, relation to your desk, where they are your psoas muscle anatomy. Also, you wanna see the lumbar plexus on MRI, where, you are, where they are on, a, on a relative to the, to the desk position. Sometimes they're more anterior That's in that scenario. You're sometimes not able to do the x lips in that patients. Positioning and intraoperative x-rays are important because you had to get the perfect lateral and AP x-rays and the do your all the all your working channel is all straight up and down. You cannot go more anterior. You cannot go more posterior. Your working channel is straight up and down. So, getting the X-rays on the lateral view is utmost important. So, decrease the retraction time to the lumbar flexors is important too. Uh, usually, the goal is to get this thing done within less than twenty minutes, but twenty to forty minutes is also okay. But usually, if you if you want to try to reduce your lumbar plexus issues postoperatively, I think is get this done. Get this done in every level within a twenty to thirty minutes is the goal. Real time neuro monitoring and trigger EMGs is integral part of the procedure to reduce the neuronal injuries when you are doing dilators or once you position your position a tube. Finally, you can check all the neuro monitoring inside as well to make sure you are not near to the nerve. So postoperatively, transient motor and sensory neurological is always a concern. Uh, so I find out uh, this is all started in early 2000. And uh, for initial papers, like all papers we wrote before 2010, you have a more modern and sensory neurological transient issues uh, because everybody has a learning curve. But now as you, you're looking for recent literatures, the transient motor and sensory neurological issues are way, way lower now. There's always a rare vascular and visceral injuries if you're, if you're not in a perfect channel in the desk, um, but it's actually extremely rare. Indirect decompression, I'll be really careful about indirect decompression. Uh, I recommend to get the CT myelogram before the surgery to make sure you don't have any bony compression on the later recess and then you don't have an osteophyte which wraps around the nerve in a foramen, that's the time probably indirect decompression is uh, pretty low likely it's gonna work. Standalone lumbar interbody fusion without posterior instrumentation. I think they are doing it because uh, you're not uh, violating any structures like anterior longitudinal ligament or posterior longitudinal ligament and you are pretty fresh fit uh, lumbar interbody fusions and you are not violating the posterior any structures. 
So I think it's okay to do it like if we do for one level, but I would I would not suggest to do multi-level without doing any posterior instrumentation. So big size cage as compared to the posterior lumbar interbody fusion, which is actually decrease your subsidence rate. This subsidence rate for most of the paper for this is less than 6%. And as comparable uh, patient reported outcomes and effusion rate with uh, transpyramidal lumbar interbody fusion or posterior lumbar interbody fusion cases. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Ju. Um, I'm going to ask you one question, uh, Vero, on behalf of Dr. Henley. Um, mm -hmm. he, want, he said that you had originally mentioned that you want the concave uh, side of the deformity to be up when positioning, yeah. but yeah. you had shown a case uh, where you actually had the convex cave, uh, convex side up, and, and uh, Brad was wondering why. Yeah, uh, so that case, I, I was... Uh, so I was, I'm meaning I was looking for a concave deformity is when you have a scoliosis concave deformity and you're doing a multi-level, uh, multi-level uh, x lips. Uh, when you have a, um, one level that I have a deformity just below the fusion and then patient is coronal deformity, I think it's, uh, I, my goal was to get the, uh, I can able to start the disc discectomy when you have an open area is pretty good. And secondly, that patient has a left side up. I want to keep the left side up. You have a decrease injuries to the imperial vena cava, which is pretty hard to repair for the vascular surgeons. And your, your aorta is on the left side. And this patient has a disc more open more on the left side. So I keep the left side open. And this was my first case. So I don't want to change to the uh, right, uh, right side up uh, to have uh, something go wrong. Um, but I know this is not a good case to start as, as by yourself as a first case, um, but probably this is thanks to Dr. Wagner, he told me to do it. So, so that was the reason uh, why I was going to the left side. Uh, Vero, this is Carlo. Um, I'm sorry to have missed the, uh, the very first part of these lectures. They were both great. Um, did, did, ac did the uh, easier access uh, on the convex side, especially down where the iliac crest is so prominent, did that have any? Did that factor into your decision as well? But, I mean, you got a correction. You're on your post-op AP. The disc, the disc was level, so you were able to correct the uh, concavity pretty easily from the convex side. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. the The question is uh, when you have a, a, a three, four. Usually, iliac crest is not uh, is a big factor, but but when you are the four or five, yes, I think iliac crest is a, a big factor. But still, most of the surgeon, when you when you're able to uh, keep the concave side up, uh, that also helps the correction. But also, your L four five disc direction is a little bit away from the iliac crest when you are concave side up. So, and then also helps to do the multi level X loop just by the one in season. So you can start one in season right in the center. And then you can do L4, 5 first. Then you do L1, L2, 3 second because the high, you're going to go higher with the concavity. And then you can get corrections. And then you do 3, 4, and uh, 3, 4, 1, 2 afterwards. So that also helps the, just to do one in season. And you can do multi level X lips when you have a, a scoliosis. Uh, I've got that just sense. the. Did you get it or? That yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, just a couple more questions uh, because we're going to run out of time uh, soon here. L4-5 is where most of the complications take place, neurological complications. Uh, yeah. so first question is, do you do anything differently at L4-5? And second question is on the case you showed, the longer case that you did, uh, you're, you're looking at a transitional segmentation where with a lumbar or a sacralized L5. Yes. Are you able to do safely? Do you think L four five in those circumstances where the where there's uh, transitional segmentation and things aren't exactly uh, you're dealing with sort of a a, a cross between L four five and L five S one? Yeah, I think that um, yeah. So the, so I think it's a uh, it's, it's just where your iliac crest is. Uh, once you once you're able to get it, like if your iliac if you stay above the iliac crest, 
the any level, this is a both iliac crest you can able to do this safely just by neuromonitoring. But the L45 is yes, is always a concern because your lumbar flex is a little bit anterior. Secondly, your genital femoral nerve is way anterior. So sometimes you uh, you ended up getting uh, your, your docking between the genital femoral nerve anteriorly and the rest of the lumbar plexus posteriorly. So you can start at the right in the middle of the disc and uh, see the neuromonitoring. If neuromonitoring looks okay, you can dial it through it. And sometimes you ended up just posterior to the genital femoral nerve. So you are in between the lumbar plex, through the lumbar plexus, but you are in between the nerves. So still is doable. Um, and most of the time you actually end uh, anterior to it. And sometimes you do all the way. Uh, I, so now we have a, a, a oblique lumbar interbody fusion. So instead of making incision right on top of the L45 disc, your incision is a little bit anterior. You can just put like four centimeter, like you can start at the middle of the disc and go a little bit anterior your incision. So you're a little bit anterior. So you fill your posterior wall of the retroperitoneum I mean, retroperitoneal area, so you can feel the quadratus lumborum, and then you feel the psoas muscle, and you come right at the anterior part of the psoas, and there you can actually retract the whole psoas posteriorly with the retractor they have on the olive. So basically, you are anterior to the psoas, and then you you just with the nerve. All right, thanks, Viral. Hey, Viral, I have, I have one more question. It, it would seem that to do these minimally invasive spine procedures, um, it would really be beneficial for a surgeon to have had extensive experience doing the open procedures. And I'm, I'm asking you that because I, I think there are now spine surgeons that are really focused and, and their training is really minimally invasive. Um, is, do you agree with that or does, or can you just skip the big open type of training and uh, for example, just do a minimally invasive fellowship and, and uh, be as good at those procedures? I think it's a, I, I agree that yeah, I a hundred percent agree that you need to see everything open first in order to actually do it minimal invasive because you want, you are working through the tube channels. You can, you can be way off on anatomical landmarks and then you're way off with your decompression. Um, you have to see everything open to see, uh, see all the anatomical landmarks you look for, how much you have to do decompression. And then the, most of the surgeon falls short of the decompression when they are doing through the minimal invasive because they don't see all the anatomical landmarks you need to see while they are able to see on open. So I think it's uh, important to see everything open fast in order to be a better Thank you. Are there any other questions? Feel free to speak up. Viral, this is Wally Kringle. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, having done a lot of this stuff open, um, <laughs> when the X lift came out, I was frankly terrified of doing it. Um, minimally invasive because there's so many, so many things that if you have a problem, they're, they're a big problem. And secondly, um, there were a lot of uh, significant nerve problems in these patients that had these procedures done, as you mentioned. And I think a, a lot of people abandoned it for a while my, you know, patients with nerve injuries are, are very unhappy patients and compared to patients that have a four centimeter long incision instead of a three centimeter long incision in their side. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the single, the single level open approaches you can do with pretty small incisions and, and be very confident of what you're looking at and that nothing's in the way. Yeah. Um, the multi-level are, are different and four or five, frankly, terrifies me to do closed, but. Um, I think your concerns are right. Uh, uh, it's a huge learning curve uh, for most of the surgeon, uh, all the papers which is published before 2010, uh, they had a higher chance, higher transient neurological issues uh, postoperatively, but now over the period of time, the better retraction, better tube system and the better knowledge of the anatomy 
preoperative MRI and CT scan reviews and the neuro monitoring inside that actually help a lot to decrease this thing. And second thing is now we have a, this is I, I presented X lip, but I can, I can also able to do the O lips, which is also minimal invasive because you just do more lateral anterior to the swast and you can retract the whole swast posteriorly. You can able to see the disc. And then without uh, going through the swast, without going through the um, issues with the number plexus, you can do this uh, and minimal invasive as well. And in that case, you don't even need a neuro monitoring it's because you are way away from the lumbar plexus and because you're anterior to the psoas. Uh, but that also begs the question because you have to read your MRI uh, preoperative very carefully that you need uh, enough space between your great vessels and the psoas in order to do OLIF as well, which is oblique lumbar intervolic movement. So I think you can, you can decrease the issues uh, as, as long as uh, I, I think you are doing the right things to the patient. Um, yes, there's always a concern of transient neurological issues, but believe me, uh, most of the patient gets better within the six weeks. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, uh, Jimmy, and thank you, Viral. That that was an excellent um, overview, and um, even for a non-spine surgeon, uh, much appreciated. Um, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.